Um, and I'm a planner out at Sturgeon County, just north of Edmonton. I'm also a student at the University of Alberta. Um, and Nabil Malik beside me here is, his home is right here in Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. Um, many thanks this morning to Shell Place again for the wonderful breakfast. Um, for those of you who do have dietary restrictions, we just wanted to bring your attention. We have certain plates set up on the right hand side for you throughout the rest of the conference. So if you do have dietary restrictions, look for a plate with your name on it um, and your food will be prepared. Before we begin today's speeches, just another a few housekeeping items. I want to bring your attention to the washrooms located just outside the doors down the hallways to the right. Um, in addition, the fire and emergency exits are, well, they're very clear outside there. Go down the stairs and head outside. Um, we want to extend a very large thank you again to everybody who contributed with the conference, um, our conference committee, APPI council and staff. Thank you so much. We are pleased to be here today on tre uh, traditional Treaty 8 lands. We acknowledge all of those who share a deep connection with this land. The Institute respects the histories, languages, and cultures of all of Canada's first people, whether they, whether they be a First Nation, Métis, of, or Inuit descent, and appreciates their presence and continues to enrich Canada's vibrant communities. We are all treaty people. The peace treaties bind us all. As we head into uh, the second day of the conference, we would like to bring a couple things uh, to your attention. First, all of the conference sessions have been preloaded into the down, uh, drop-down list for the purpose of logging your uh, 2019 continuous professional learning, They're your CPLs, for those who of that applies. Uh, APPI C, um, APPI's CPL program demonstrates the institutes that the institute's regulated members are committed to ongoing learning and maintaining the highest standards of skills, knowledge, and professionalism. We remind you that often volunteering at events for APPI or other organizations are often eligible to be logged in for CPLs. If you need any assistance with logging your CPLs, please do not hesitate to visit one of uh, the administration t uh, staff from APPI uh, at the registration desk. They have uh, also created a cheat sheet for your CPL um, logging uh, that, would be, that they would be happy to share with you. We'd also like to uh, remind delegates and members about the awesome benefits uh, that you have with Percopolis. Percopolis is Canada's leading provider of fully managed per program. It is used by over 2,000 Canadian organizations. Percopolis is continually sourcing exclusive high-value offers, rewards, and benefits uh, for you, that is APPP, APPI members, so that you can enjoy pricing and deals from North America's top entertainment, travel, shopping, and lifestyle brands. One of the best deals that I often use, and I know I'm sure that many of you use, is the 15% off uh, the WestJet uh, flights. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact uh, or uh, speak with one of the APPI administration team at the registra registration desk. Um, also, if you happen to lose anything throughout this conference, um, again, please uh, talk to uh, the APPI administration, um, and they'll be happy to uh, source the, your lost items. I'd also like to bring it to your attention that this um, event and all, all, all our sessions, our um, photographs and videos will be taken. Um, and may be used for APPI print or digital media. Uh, if you do not authorize the use of your photographs or video, please contact a APPI administration. We just kindly ask you to self-identify so we're not using your um, image or, or, or in video. It is now my esteemed pleasure to welcome the mayor of the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, the Honorable Don Scott, to welcome the delegates to the t APPI conference and bringing greetings from his council. Well, thanks very much. I am very honored to be here among you all today. And it's been 10 years since the conference has been in Fort McMurray. And you may have noticed that a few things have changed in 10 years. We've had a flood. Uh, everyone forgets about the flood. There was a flood before the fire. Then there was a fire. And then we had the economic downturn. So this is a place that's full of dynamic change. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I am so happy to see that planners are here. Uh, we understand that you're going to be giving us some feedback on some of the issues and some of the tours that you're taking. I hope everyone gets a real sense of what this community is about, not just the, from a planning perspective, but the people. 
This is one of the most multicultural communities uh, in all of Canada. I always say we're more multicultural than Toronto. So uh, anyone from Toronto, I hope you'll take that back and start telling them that we're boasting uh, that we're, we're way better than them uh, in more ways than one. So I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of Marin Council. I'm really excited about the keynote today. I, not many people know this or would recall this if, unless you were really paying attention to government. I know no one really pays attention to governments. But uh, Doug Griffiths, who I see to my left here, was one of my colleagues. Uh, he was a minister when I was a minister, and he was an MLA when I was an MLA. And one of the most brilliant guys that uh, I ever served with. I always said that someday in the future, Doug, you should be the Premier of Alberta, and he would always shyly shake his head, no, no, never. But uh, I still believe that. Uh, he's, uh, he's that dynamic. The words that I've heard just around the room from people who have heard him speak before were brilliant, uh, thoughtful and uh, many others. And one of the, the best stories that I still tell about Doug Griffiths is when I was really young, uh, well, really young, three years ago, uh, it seems like a hundred <laughs> years, I, uh, I walked into Doug's office when we were meeting for the first time, and he had a book on his desk, and it was uh, my favorite book from when I was younger, which was Sun Tzu and the Art of War, and he had it sitting on his desk, and I thought, wow, I'm going to really get along with this guy, and I always did. Uh, he's just an amazing person. So, Doug, I'd like to welcome you, especially to the community. We are so excited to, uh, to have you here, and we hope that you'll get a, a good tour as well during your visit. I, I know there's many of us that are excited about your keynote, so welcome, uh, welcome again to Fort McMurray and to Wood Buffalo. Uh, another few facts about Wood Buffalo. We are the largest municipality in North America, so we always boast about that, but as you can imagine, that comes with its own planning challenges that uh, you can't imagine, I guess. Uh, although we have a few people in the room that do imagine it, we have a lot of our planners here. And our deputy CIO is right there, Jamie Doyle. Jamie, stand up and give a big wave. He has been, he's a deputy CIO now, but he was in the planning department for what seems like 100 years here. So, 103, <laughs> 103 years. So. A lot of what you see in this community you can attribute to him, so if you have any questions, be sure to corner him. Uh, I'm sure he would enjoy answering all the questions. But we have no problems, as you can imagine, uh, unlike other communities. And uh, I see Jamie, like, shaking his head now. He doesn't even want to... We have, like, a thousand problems a day, I think, that, t that we try to deal with, much like all of you. But uh, please come back again. Don't let the conference wait ten years till you return to Fort McMurray. We would like to see you back. Uh, we certainly enjoy your presence and we hope that you will return to this community. I know that you're going to have a blessing from Pollyanna at some point, and uh, Pollyanna, we're always excited to have you give a blessing at our, at our events, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. And once again, we are honored to have you on Treaty 8 and unceded Métis territory. So welcome again. Have a great conference, everybody. We hope you have a great tour of the community and that you enjoy the lovely facilities here. And uh, we'll see you again, hopefully not 10 years from now. And uh, Doug, welcome back again. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Scott. And uh, welcome to the 2019 Alberta Professional Planners Institute Conference. My name is Mac Hickley. I'm the president of APPI. And it's my pleasure and honor to uh, open this conference formally. And uh, on behalf of APPI Council and the Institute, I'm, uh, I'd just like to m welcome you to celebrate strength here with us in uh, all our sessions that have been planned for you this, this weekend or this week. So our conference committee has been uh, doing an amazing job lining up speakers and sessions, co-chaired by Haley Waslicia and Nabil Malik down here. And I'd like to thank them for their amazing work, and uh, as well as the other committee members, Stephen Yu, Stephen Rates, Jennifer Wardle, Jared Candlish, Kendra Raymond, Jordan Zukowski, Pretty Gruelson, Heather Chisholm, Natasha DeSandy, and Sarah Burku. Just give that group a hand, hand for a moment. <laughs> Thanks. There's also a few. Uh, dignitaries from uh, the APPI sector that I'd like to mention, and if you could just uh, stand up or wave your hand momentarily when I call your name. Councillors Aaron O'Neill, past president. <laughs> uh, Kate Van Frassen. 
Chelsea Witte, <laughs> Gary Wilson, Glynis, where are you, Gary? Uh, Glynis Buffalo, Bernice Gonzalez, and Amanda Bree Watson. Also here today is the uh, president of the Canadian Institute of Planners, Eleanor Mohammed. <laughs> and now one more introduction. Uh, I'd like to, I'm pleased to call uh, Elder Pollyanna McBain to welcome all of you conference delegates and acknowledge our presence here on Treaty 8 land. Elder Pollyanna. <laughs> Elder Pollyanna McBain is a Mi'kmaq woman from the Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick. She's a cultural navigator for the First Nation Métis and Inuit Education Program for the Fort McMurray Public School Division, as well as a worker for the Nistawoyu Friendship Center. Pollyanna has been here since 2014 and has created strong communities, uh, uh, strong connections across uh, the Wood Buffalo region with First Nations Métis and Inuit. And we're honored and thrilled to have her here with us today to share her extensive indigenous knowledge, teachings, storytelling, and wisdom. Thank you very much. Good morning. Kwe, Wilesikbo. That's hello and good morning in Mi'kmaq. I too am a visitor here on Treaty 8, and it's quite an honor to be here. It's been very kind to me. I come from the province of New Brunswick where we had something similar to what you have today. It's called Jedi. I was a Jedi princess. <laughs> I was there when I was born. It was called Joint Economic Development Initiative. Where we were First Nations, we had a tripartite process. And at the chairs, the chairs were a federal, provincial, and First Nations chair. And they chaired the meetings on planning, on community development, like yourselves today. So being a part of JEDI and working for Indian Northern Affairs Canada at the time in employment equity, it was nice to see the federal and provincial governments at the table, as well as private and public sector. Because when you planned, they were the guts of your planning. Because with federal and provincial governments at the table, you understand rules and regulations and bylaws and your limits. By having public sector there, you got to know where the employment opportunities were. It also allowed the First Nation companies to bid on the, the mercs of the government's um, their bidding process when it came to land development, highway development, so that we were allowed to have the First Nation contractors to apply for some of those, some of those mercs. When you are planning, some of the best advice I can give you is always think about the next generations to come and how this is going to affect them. As small as building a community leisure place, the longevity of that. And you need to work with people in the waterworks. You need to work with the electricians. And there's so many players involved in erecting such a thing as a community leisure place. And then there's the infrastructure and finding out where everything goes. So there's a lot of players that get involved at every level. As an Aboriginal woman, I'm quite proud of you. I mean, you're all here together, and you're all for the same objective, building strong communities and building things that will last, and hopefully for a very long time, because that is your vision. Today, I am no longer a Jedi princess, but that's OK. Now I get to work with your children. And in the schools, I have First Nation students who will come in 
and they're hanging around with somebody who is Muslim or there's somebody, somebody who's from Africa. And they stay outside my door. And I said, please, come in. Oh, no, no, miss. This is for First Nation. I said, that's where you're wrong. Your color is on my medicine wheel. My room is open to all of you. Because without your color, my medicine wheel is no good to me. Because that medicine wheel represents every race in this world. And all we want and all we pray for is that you learn to work together and live together in peace and harmony. I wish you well on, your, on the next couple of days of your endeavors. And, oh, look, there's me. <laughs> oh, look, over there, too. Wait till I tell this at the elders' luncheon. There's three of me. <laughs> Not eight. I was wrong. Minus the five. There's just three. I wish you well on your conferences, and I wish that you learn plenty. And you're all very well-educated people, and I'm aware of that. But make sure you take time to breathe. And make sure that you take time to ground yourself. And make sure to take the time to walk on the earth without your shoes. Even now, it's a little bit cool. But do the test of endurance just for 20 minutes. There's something, I don't even think the mayor is aware of this. Brad, you better be listening to me. I need your attention. There is a very, very spiritual vortex here in Fort McMurray. And it exists in Sedona, Arizona as well. We were on the same longitude. And since I've moved here, my, re my ears constantly ring. And they ring louder when it's northern lights. So I know that the, evol the evolution, well not sorry, the, um, because I'm so high up to the sky here, elevation, that's the word I'm looking for. That's why my ears ring louder. So you, I'm in tune with my body and what it does and what it says. I love it when my nose twitches. It's usually a money indicator, a good hint for you all to know. But because of this spiritual vortex that is here, I am truly more grounded here than I've ever been in any other province except for my home province. And I lived in just about every province in Canada, minus the Manitoba and Saskatchewan. But I lived everywhere else. So I want to thank you so much for having me here today and enlighten you with some humor, because it is the best medicine ever. And I wish you well on your planning and your developments and all the networking that you're going to do. Thank you, and I wish you well. Ciao. Thank you so much, Pollyanna, and thank you, Mac. Um, as we move into our keynote session, again, just a couple housekeeping reminders. Um, we want to remind you that immediately after following the keynote, um, there is a tour of the rivers that join us, um, and that will be departing from the main lobby at 10 o'clock a.m. So if you are booked on that tour, please make sure that you do make yourself make your way down to the lobby in a timely manner. At this time, um, please hold your applause till the end. I'd like to acknowledge the two platinum sponsors of the APPI conference the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo, and the City of Calgary. Thank you so much. We would also like to acknowledge the support of our gold sponsors, Stantec, the City of Edmonton, and Urban Systems. Thank you. As we move into this morning's keynote, I would now like to welcome Jamie Doyle to the stage. He's an RPP and the Deputy CAO with the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. Welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. 
I do have to tell you it's pretty dangerous putting me on a blank stage with a microphone that's in my hand, no cord attached or pedestal. But welcome, welcome to the RMWB. I hope you've been enjoying your first day and into your second day. Uh, it's a, quite a lovely region, as the mayor has mentioned earlier, so please take the time to enjoy it. As you know now, I'm, I'm the deputy CAO. My name is Jamie Doyle, but I'm also a proud uh, registered professional planner with APPI. And as the platinum sponsor for this morning's keynote, it's my privilege to introduce Doug Griffiths. I've gotten to know Doug over the past little bit, and I can tell you, he can drink beer pretty fast. <laughs> and if you haven't seen any of his engagements, you're in for quite a treat. It, he is really a great speaker. Doug is the president and CEO of 13 Ways Inc., a company he founded to provide consultation to struggling North American communities. He is the co-author of the book, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. Now in its second edition, the book has become the go-to manual for community building in North America. I really tried to memorize that, Doug, and I couldn't get the last bit of it, so I had to read it. <clears throat> He's also an instructor at the University of Alberta for the past three years. Doug is a formal Canadian, former Canadian politician and member of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta, representing the constituency of Battle River Wainwright as a progressive conservative. He has since taken a step back, I think you said several steps last time we, we chatted, back from provincial politics in favor of his role with 13 Ways and his teaching duties, where he has found an ability to make a profound change in communities across North America. Please help me welcome Doug. Hope you're all doing, whoa, that's, <laughs> So, I hope you're all doing well this morning. Um, I am, thank you for the introduction, Jamie. I did take several steps back from politics. In fact, I've been through rehab, so I'm not, I'm, I'm fully treated now. Um, and thank you, Mayor Scott, for, for those kind words. Um, Dawn was one of my favorite MLAs in a, in a place where, um, well, Don was always very creative about coming up with solutions to the current challenges the province had all the time and never once compromised his integrity or his focus on making sure that our plans were good for Albertans. And that's rarer than you think it would be, which is unfortunate. But Don, the feeling is mutual. So look, I'm really excited to be here because uh, last night, uh, you guys were rowdy. <laughs> you had a lot of fun at the pub. And I, I looked around constantly and realized I am not... Yet usually I'm one of the youngest people in the room, and I figure the average age is about the same age as I am, which is good. There are a lot of young, energetic people here, and that's fantastic. Because if you've heard my other presentation, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, you know that it is about the attitudes that sabotage our success. And every community has those folks that sabotage success because they don't want change. But even when I go to communities that are really energized, and they say, okay, Doug, we get it, finally, this is really exciting, we gotta do something, I realize when I talk to them, they're still trying to get ready for today. And that's not good enough. See, every single industry in the world has undergone change and challenges. There have been disruptions that have unbalanced them all. But communities are about to experience more disruptions than any other industry over the next 15 years. And that's what this presentation is about. If you're trying to prepare your community for the issues of today, you're already too late. You have to start to get ready to build your community for the challenges that you, you can marginally identify coming at you in the next 15 years. That's what this presentation is about, okay? Ready? All right. Our perspective matters tremendously when we're dealing with change and with issues. And I just want to remind you, I mean, it's, this is apparently a quote from the head of the U.S. Patent Office in 1899. He said, everything that has, can be invented has been invented. I don't even know if that's a true statement, but in 1899, I, I mean, there were people that had that perspective that nothing else was going to change. We had done just about everything we needed to do. Yet, from the day the Wright brothers took off from their first flight, it took 66 years before we landed on the moon. That's how much change happens and how quickly it comes. And it's ironic that so many of us fear change. We don't like change at all. And yet, the reason why we don't like change is because we changed. Every young person we meet says, oh, well, I'm going to help change the world. I'm going to make it different and better. And then as we get older, we start to resist that change more and more. And that's, that's a massive irony that because we changed, we no longer like change. 
And yet every single thing in our world has changed. I mean, I always point this out. For 30,000 years, our society were hunters and gatherers. We moved, our entire society formed around that. I mean, I picked the woolly mammoth. We would chase down the woolly mammoth and we hunted it and we gathered berries. That's what we did for 30,000 years. And our society formed around that fact. That's why we had very small families. You could only carry one or two kids when you were constantly on the move. But we had big clans because we needed to work together for that hunting and gathering. And when, when our economy was based on that, it was like that for 30,000 years. And then agriculture was invented or discovered. It depends on who you talk to. And that changed our entire world again. Because now we were suddenly stationary and we grew crops. And when we grew crops, we didn't need big plants anymore, but now we needed big families to help work the crops and to work on the farm, right? And nothing changed for 5,000 years. And then the Industrial Revolution came along. Only 300 years ago, the Industrial Revolution happened. I mean, that was the invention of the steam engine. And it changed our entire society. Now, now cities started to form. We started to mass produce goods and we started to travel more and our world became smaller and the economy became bigger. It transformed our society. 30,000 years, 5,000 years, and 300 years. Change is speeding up on us. And now we're sitting here in the technological age and it's only 30, maybe 40 years old at the most and it has transformed our society completely. I mean, here's some examples, okay? I, the cell phone, let's talk about that. Let's see if I can make this work. No, I, okay, there we go. The cell phone. I like this little remote, you're gonna see why. The first cell phone to ever appear on a movie was right there. That was Danny Glover, the actor in the movie Lethal Weapon. You remember seeing that picture? I mean, he was on a bridge. It was a regular phone on top of a car battery. The movie Lethal Weapon doesn't seem like it's that old, but it goes back a long ways. The first time, it, I think they hired Danny Glover because he was the only one strong enough to carry the thing, right? That was the first time a cell phone appeared on TV. And then we got these. I mean, I was elected 17 years ago, my very first day, and we used to have those big cell phones that you put on your hip and it would cause hip dysplasia, right? It was <laughs> so heavy. And then they gave me one of these, a StarTac phone. 17 years ago, that was cutting edge technology. Dawn wasn't there at the time, but I used to walk around the legislature and flip it open like Star Trek and say, beam me up, Scotty, there's no intelligent life here in the legislature. <laughs> yeah, the other MLAs didn't find that funny at all, but I did. <laughs> that thing held 10 phone numbers. That's it. No names, you couldn't even put a one in front of the phone number, it, that's it. That was cutting edge technology 16 years ago, and now we have these. I mean, these cell phones now have more technology than the stuff that launched the space shuttle in the palm of your hand. It's transformed everything. And I encourage you, put your cell phones, get them out right now, if you want. I don't encourage you to put them away. Get them out, look at the call button. Because this, you remember these? Right? I mean, we had one of these on the farm. It was still a party line. My grandma used to listen in on the, you know, you lift it up and you listen to the neighbor's conversations. They had one of these sitting on the counter at a haircutting, hairdressing place when I took my oldest, who was 11 at the time, to get his hair cut. And he looked at it. And it wasn't plugged in. It didn't work. He just looked at it, though, and said, Dad, what is that? It's like, son, that's a telephone. We used to make phone calls on that. And he looked at it for a minute. And then he said, I think you're lying to me. It's like, why would I, you think I'm lying to you? And he looked at it and said, well, because where do you get the pictures? Because every phone he's ever seen gets pictures on it. And then he picked it up and he suddenly looked at it and said, oh, that's why the symbol for the call button is this. He has never seen one of those. And so I realized he didn't know what that was. And he didn't even know why we have that symbol for the call button. And now I used to have a picture of a flip phone, the ones that fold together, the, the, the folding ones, except now those are, those are coming out again. Samsung's reintroducing them after they fix some glitches. So this is the new cutting edge phone. This, you know those plastic straps you bang on your wrist and it wraps around? This, these now will wrap around your wrist and they will unfold, open up to a tablet size, open up to a computer size, back to a cell phone size and wrap around your wrist. That is coming in the next few years. That is the future of technology. Uh, let's look at a, a uh, computer. I mean, this is a picture of one of the first computers ever made. 
This thing, it was in a room this size, and it had vacuum tubes to run the computer so it could do addition. That's all it did was add stuff up. It was massive. And when they asked one of the inventors, how many computers do you think the world can handle? He said, I think we have room for about five. Right? And then these things were invented, the desktop computers, and it transformed everything. Suddenly everybody had one in their own house. And now they look like this. There's a microchip in the back of the computer screen. You don't even need the big tower anymore under your desk or on your desk to fill it up anymore. And do you remember these, the three and a half inch floppy? Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, we used to have five of them to store all the data we needed, right? I was moving into our new house and I was unpacking my office and under the bottom flap in a box was one of those. I hadn't seen it in years. I pulled it out. And my youngest, who was eight at the time, looked at me and goes, oh, dad, that's cool. I was like, what uh, is wrong with you? And he said, well, you know someone who's got a 3D printer. I was like, what? He said, well, somebody printed off the save button because that's the symbol for save on Word. <laughs> I was like, what? I, he didn't even know these things existed. That's how much the world has changed and how quickly it has changed. And now we've got the intersection of our, our computers and our cell phones all coming together. And that's where a lot of new innovations are coming, is the intersection of new technologies. And then I've got one more to show you. A vehicle. I have some engineering friends and I asked them, give me a definition of the most basic vehicle possible. And they said, it has to have wheels. And it has to be powered by something other than people. So there you go. There is a, oh, we better push the button first. There's a vehicle, a horse and buggy. Yay. Hey. So, great. Now then I saw this interview, or read this interview, apparently with Henry Ford, when he was working on mass producing vehicles. And apparently they said, you know what, people don't like these vehicles. They're too loud, they're too noisy, they leak, they smell. Why are you bothering to push this forward? And his response was, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? Because most people don't know what's coming and what's possible, and so it's hard to ask them their opinion because they just want faster of whatever they have, not realizing the innovations that are coming. So, there we go. I want you to keep that in mind. If I asked people what they wanted, faster horses, nobody wanted these things because they were loud and they were noisy and they smelled and they leaked, right? Here's a picture of New York Avenue, Fifth Avenue in New York City in the year 1900. There is one vehicle and all the rest are horse and buggies. They're not going to catch on. Here is a picture of the same street, Fifth Avenue in New York City in the year 1913. Just 13 years later, they are all vehicles and one horse and buggy that's circled for you to see. That's even when we don't individually want technology and change, it comes anyway because society adapts to change whether we like it or not. And there is a picture of a Tesla. Now, I tell people a Tesla is an electric car. It has a million mile warranty because there's nothing to break down. I mean, there are three to seven moving parts in an average Tesla vehicle, depending on the model you have, which is why they have a million mile warranty. That includes the motor and the transmission. In a typical combustion engine, it has between 200 and 250 moving parts just in the engine alone which is why they break down. People say, oh, you know, those electric cars are not going to catch on. Yes, they are. And they're going to stay. They are not going to disappear. And in fact, you know, I tell people that Tesla vehicle is as different from a combustion engine as the combustion engine is from a horse and buggy. So be prepared. Now, I, I want to show you something about the uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, LiDAR technology. Do you know what, you guys know what LiDAR technology is, right? Laser radar technology that allows uh, an, an autonomous vehicle that drives itself to see, right? It's what separates the fire hydrant from the dog and the light post from a person. It can see, okay? Now, when the first one came out, it was in 2010, I believe. I haven't looked at this. It, I added this slide again for you guys' benefits. 2010, I think it was. It was $150,000 per vehicle. The LiDARs were as tall as me, about this big around. They put it on the roof of the vehicle for a demonstration, and they had to tie it to the corners with cables as thick as my wrist. And when it was on the track doing the test, it almost tipped over. It was so top heavy. And everyone said $150,000 for vehicle. It's never going to work. They're too big. They're cumbersome. I mean, it'll be 30 or 40 years before LiDAR technology is ready to be used. And then, just two years later, it was down to half the price and half the size. The next year, it was down again 
to a thousand dollar ten thousand dollars per vehicle and about a quarter of the size in 2014 it was one thousand dollars a vehicle in 2016 it is now 250 dollars a vehicle and they are the size a little bit smaller than a hockey puck and my calculations and all the forecasts from doing research indicate I had said $90 by 2021, but Ford put in a massive order in Europe and the price is now down to $10 per LiDAR. And the estimate is by 2022, they will be a little bigger than a postage stamp. You see how everyone said 30 or 40 years before this technology really becomes useful, it took less than 10 years for it to become useful and be included in vehicle technology. And there is a nice picture of an autonomous vehicle. I could certainly go to work in that, right? And get work done while I'm on my way instead of driving. Now my estimate is, from all the research I did, that 10 years from now, 35% of all vehicles on the road will be autonomous. And 15 years from now, not 15 years after that, 15 years from now, 85% of all vehicles on the road will be autonomous. And before you say, no, that will never catch on, remember, I just showed you the picture of Fifth Avenue in New York and showed you how much this catches on, the technology that changes. In fact, in 2016, a beer truck, it's in California, so they don't have any snow, but it made its first delivery of 50,000 beers with a, an autonomous robotic truck. It's made a delivery every week since then, and the last I checked, it still has not had a single accident. And in fact, there is a mine here in Fort McMurray that tried an autonomous vehicle. It started running, I mean, the driver was up on the, the ledge watching and everything and supervising it, but it was an autonomous vehicle running. And you know what, when they, they converted that truck over, they found the biggest issue was? The human drivers that were also in the same mine caused chaos. And so they converted the entire mine to autonomous vehicles, that entire pit to autonomous vehicles, and they haven't had a single accident since. Those are high paying jobs, but you're not going to stop the technology from coming no matter what. It's coming anyway. So uh, here's some information I think about autonomous vehicles. They're going to be electric. I already showed you the trend. I guarantee you they're going to be electric. They are also going to have high performance storage batteries in the back. I mean, we haven't quite got there yet, but Elon Musk, Musk just said yesterday, he's looking at batteries that will last weeks on one charge. Now, they think they'll get there. And we'll have uh, uh, brilliant computers that will help calculate and design those for us. They will uh, have solar windows in the vehicles. In fact, the University of Michigan just over four years invented, created the first solar windows. They're only about that big, but they and the University of Alberta are the two universities in North America that are advancing the technology right now so that they can be windows in buildings and windows in cars so that homes and buildings can be off the grid and cars won't need to pull over to charge. The solar windows, windows will charge the high performance storage battery as it moves along and it will be electric. And it will, no driver, of course, that's what autonomous means. And actually, since a regular taxi cab costs, 80% of the cost, it goes to the driver. That's a high, high cost. With no driver, it starts to run very efficiently, right? And it has no need to park. Now, just imagine, even if it's a Tesla vehicle worth $100,000, and it doesn't need to refuel, it doesn't need oil changes, it doesn't need a driver, it doesn't need to stop, it doesn't need to do anything like that, it's operating costs amortized over a million miles is pretty cheap. It's pretty affordable to run one. Compare that to our current vehicles. I mean, the Stats Canada says that the average vehicle that you own costs about $10,000 a year, and it is parked 95% of the time. Wow, that's not a very good investment. That's not a very good investment at all. I mean, it needs fuel, it needs parking. You've got to have a garage or two car garage or a three car garage. You've got to buy insurance. You've got uh, maintenance and cleaning. And here's the kicker, okay? Car accidents, death by vehicles, is the number one cause of death that's non-disease related. Cars kill more people than anything but diseases. Wow. That's a huge cost to society. And I tell you this stat because I have people come to me after and say, oh, Doug, but those Tesla cars, I mean, they've been in two or three accidents, killed two or three people, cut their heads right off because they were sleeping while the vehicle was driving. Uh, two or three people is a small margin compared to what vehicles that humans drive are causing deaths, right? 
So, I mean, compare those two things. It's why my niece and nephew look at me and say, I have no intention of owning a vehicle. It is one of the worst investments you can ever have. I'll just have an app on my phone. They already use Uber all the time. They'll just call up an autonomous vehicle to come and pick them up. What does that mean to communities? Disruptions galore. I mean, when you, uh, when you bring in autonomous vehicles, do you need to build homes that have garages and driveways? Do you need to build large overpasses and ring roads? Do you need to build gas stations and places for people to stop? Do you need parking spots? Do you need wide roads? And that means huge disruptions to governments and their budgets too. Do you need those ring roads and overpasses? Those overpasses are expensive. Right, Don? <laughs> we, we know. Do you need buses and subways? I mean, I don't want anyone to get offended here, but there are a couple of municipalities uh, in Alberta that want subways or LRTs or C trains. I won't name names, though. Right? <laughs> but they want about $10 billion from the province to add each of them a new line. Collectively, they want $10 billion to build those new lines. And what happens when you do those, build those lines? I mean, you've got to do the public communication and consultation in the neighborhoods where you plan on building them to get the public feedback. Then you give them a design so that they can give feedback again and you can make sure you divert any problems that you might have. And then you apply to the government and then you have to raise money yourself and then you have to do more public consultations and then you finally get the money and then you have to do the engineering diagrams and then, I mean, they don't get built overnight. So then you have to build them. 15 years we're talking about to get a new C train or LRT line built for $10 billion. And 15 years. What happens 15 years from now if 85% of the vehicles on the road are autonomous and they work virtually cost free? I mean, we're talking about, about pennies a mile that have no driver and electric windows and so they, they, they operate virtually cost free and you can call one up on an app and it comes to your front door and picks you up and takes you all the way across the city and drops you off at the next door for two bucks. Who in their right mind is going to hop on a bus, walk a third of a block to get on a bus, to go to the LRT, to go all the way across the city, to then get off there and get on a bus to go another distance across the city just to get dropped off a third of the block from a distance where they got to walk to get to the house and it costs six or seven dollars and that's subsidized by the government and we invested ten billion dollars of capital to get it done. Fifteen years from now what if we build those those new LRT and C train lines and we have the grand opening and nobody shows up because it's obsolete technology. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it but are we even asking the impact that technology is going to have on how we're designing our communities? But a lot of times, our larger centers are kind of pinned down and hemmed down by their investments that they've already made. They get leapfrogged by smaller communities that are more robust and haven't overly invested in those technologies. And cultures do that too. And so consider, even the nature of business is changing. Uber is the world's largest taxi company and it doesn't own a single vehicle. Airbnb is the world's largest accommodation provider. Doesn't own a single piece of real estate except its own head office. Uh, WeChat is the world's largest text messaging application now and the world's second largest funds transfer application. So if I have WeChat, which I do, and Don has WeChat, I can send Don money using WeChat. Have you ever heard of it? It's in China. It is their number one texting application, but it is the number one in the world. Alibaba is the world's largest retailer, yet it doesn't own a single product or keep a product in stock. It just marries up buyers and sellers. It's like our version of Amazon, but again, it's in China. Uh, Facebook is the world's most prolific source of media, but it does not make a single bit of its own content. Its users do well, <laughs> unless Mark Zuckerberg's making a video saying, I'm sorry about your personal data. <laughs> That's about all they make. Uh, Bitcoin is the world's largest cryptocurrency. There are almost 1,500 cryptocurrencies still in the world right now. Bitcoin happens to be the largest. And the most interesting fact about that is that Bitcoin is not owned by any country. So countries manage their economy by managing their currency. The more people that move to a currency not controlled by any government, the less control governments have over their own economy. And Netflix is the world's largest purveyor of movies, but it doesn't own a single theater. Apple is the world's second largest maker of cell phones and the world's largest maker of apps, except it doesn't make its own apps. Its users make their apps for them, and it doesn't even make their own cell phones. You know who makes 79% of, of the Apple cell phone? 
Samsung, through Foxconn, the company they created to make their own phones. They don't even make their own phones. The nature of business is changing dramatically. So here's some stats for you. Moore's Law says the number of transistors on a circuit board doubles every 24 months. These are all proving true. Crider's Law says disk drive density, the storage capacity, doubles every 13 months, which is why we don't have the three and a half inch floppy. Now we have 16 gigabytes on a thumb drive. Hende's Law says di the digital imaging doubles every 24 months, which is why so few of us actually own a camera anymore. We take pictures with our phones. Butter's Law says that optical fiber transmission capacity is doubling every nine months. And this is fascinating for municipalities because for a municipality, doesn't matter what you, your water, your sewer, your roads, you double the population, you have to double the capacity of that infrastructure. But with fiber optic transmission, once it's installed in the ground, they are doubling its capacity every nine months without having to rip it out. That's a smart investment. And Nielsen's Law says home network connection speeds are doubling around the world every 21 months. That's remarkable. Now look, I know most people look at me and go, <laughs> okay, thanks. So it doesn't make much sense, and it, it's hard to understand the impact. So let's look at something you do understand, money. We all get money. So here's the deal. You give me $1,000, and I will go invest it for you. And I promise it will double every 24 months, every two years, okay? That's the deal. That means you give me $1,000, in two years, it's worth two, and in two more years, it's worth four. You, you see where I'm going with this, right? That's all you have to give me is the initial investment of $1,000. At the end of 10 years, you will have $32,000. At the end of 20 years, you will have over $1 million. And at the end of 30 years, you will have almost $33 million. That's what technology is doing. But that's every 24 months. Some of that was doubling every nine months or every 12 months or every 15 months. So let's look at it once a year, I will double it. Same deal, a thousand dollar investment, I will double it every month. That means at the end of 10 years, you will have over $1 million. At the end of 20 years, you will have over $1 billion. And the, the end of 30 years, you'll have over three or over $1 trillion. That's crazy, but that's what technology is, is doing. That's the growth rate that we're experiencing with technology. Everything is changing. Autonomous vehicles are coming. We have new medical doctors, robotic doctors, that are not just getting dozens of times better accuracy for, for diagnosing diseases for patients. We're talking thousands of times more accurate diagnoses for patients. But we're not training our students to utilize the technology, which is why millennials are so frustrated with the education system. They are actually, imagine, let's use engineering. They go into engineering their first year and they get a computer and they get the textbook and they get the program. In two years, the technology doubles. In two more years when they graduate, it's doubled again and they're still using the same computer and the same program. And they're coming out and being told by, by companies, you're not trained to use the technology and the programs that we have now. You're not qualified to do this job. And they're incredibly frustrated because our education systems are holding on to old paradigms that don't address the new economy and the way the world is changing. And we're going to be leapfrogged by other countries if we don't change. And it all starts with connectivity. That is the core and the root of everything that's going to help us adapt. If I have another list of 13 more ways to kill your community. If you've heard the first one, chapter one is water because it's life sustaining. We need it. Well, chapter one in the next one is don't have connectivity and high speed internet because it is as fundamental to our future as we transform our communities as water is to our very survival. Connectivity is incredibly important. And for so many things, I mean, augmented reality is, is going to be bigger than virtual reality. I go to Portugal, my wife's Portuguese. We go to Portugal and I hold up my Google phone and I take a picture of a sign and it translates it into English for me. I don't even think I have to take the picture. I just hold it up now and it translates, which is crazy to me. Google was working on Google Glasses that would help so you could see everything right up front. Now they're working on Google Contacts that you will put into your eye and it will sync to your phone. And then when I say, okay, Google, take me to the nearest gas station, you know how you look on the phone, it gives you the green line to go where to go. It will appear right here and show me to go down the stairs and out the door. You guys won't see it, but I will with my Google contacts. 
That's the kind of stuff that is coming at us in the next few years. And you know what? As much as anyone says, oh, I don't like this. I'm, I'm kind of scared of this. I think it's, it needs to stop. Millennials are going to drive that change more than anyone else. And before you give them hell, remember, well, this is a young audience. So, But those of you who aren't young, remember, you used to be young ones too. And you had the same idea they did. I am going to change the world. And they will change it. Economic changes are going to be derived out of those technology changes. I mean, online shopping is one of the biggest issues our towns face now, right? We go online to shop, no one goes downtown, oh, our businesses are closing, it's a challenge. Well, I know, people keep saying, oh, Amazon is changing the world and changing the economy and I can't compete with Amazon. Right. Don't. You shouldn't be competing with Amazon. If you're trying to compete with Amazon, you've missed the boat. Amazon knows that can't, you can't compete with Amazon, and in fact, Amazon knows that they have a very limited model. See, they focus on price. They have bulk stuff, so they're able to give you the best price. No one else can compete, right? Except price is not the only way to compete. You have price, uh, sorry, you have quality, selection, service, atmosphere, experience, all those things that help drive customers to your business. And I, I remind people, in the town of Castor, there is a pharmacist who said, I'm going to do things a little bit different. And he converted his pharmacy into like a, a turn-of-the-century apothecary. It was in the Edmonton Journal. He has people coming from hundreds of miles away to see it because it's like a tourist attraction. And they still come there today, even though it's been two years, to, for the experience and the atmosphere. He certainly doesn't compete on price because somehow he had to pay for that renovation. Yet people still come there. Price is not everything. And in fact, even Amazon knows the price is not everything. Because when they started going into the grocery business, if they really thought it was just about price, they would have bought some cheap, major discount grocery chain. And they didn't. They bought Whole Foods, an expensive, unique, experience-based, organic-based grocery chain. Because they know you can't just compete on price on everything. And in fact, the next generation is willing to pay more for quality food, which I'll show you in another slide, and quality products. It's not just about price, especially for the next generation. But that means even when we hire people. Studies show right now that what you pay millennials is not the biggest driving factor. It gets up to about seventy or $75,000 as the number one motivator. But after that, it, Covey pointed out they want autonomy, purpose, and mastery. They want to be amazing at what they do, masters of it. They want to know why they do it as part of the whole organization, and they want autonomy to manage it. That's what the next generation is looking for because they're not just driven by money. So both sides of the chain are not driven by price. We were in one community that was really interesting. They invited us to give them a hand with their economy because they were having trouble. And I, I thought, okay, this is interesting. It's in the United States. That's all I can tell you. And so myself and another person went there. They had a great housing market. Like this house was probably $150,000, 180 if it was high quality. They all looked the same. They were all really nice houses and they were all really affordable. They had a great manufacturing industry. They had lots of little manufacturers around and those manufacturers couldn't find people to work in those jobs. They couldn't attract them there even though they were paying well and there was affordable housing. And they said, we have an issue, we have a problem. Now, it was an aesthetically pleasing community. It was, it was green, it was walkable, it was friendly, it was nice. Like, why wouldn't people want to live there? Now, they had an issue. They lost a major um, taxpayer. It was a waste to energy facility and they closed down because it wasn't efficient and they gave the, the community a bit of money and said, here, try and reinvent yourself, figure something out. So they had a tax base for a couple years to transition. So they created an economic development authority, tax-free zones, the county rural development authority, and a revolving loan fund. They were giving $800,000 a year to the golf course. They gave $250,000 to a Mexican restaurant because the basement flooded and they were going to close. They said, don't close. Here's $250,000, renovate. And if you stay open for 10 years, you don't even have to pay it back. And they did. And still, they couldn't seem to fire up their economy and draw new people to the community. So they asked us to help. So we went in and we had a meeting with parents. We had a meeting with seniors. We had a meeting with business association leaders. We had a meeting with the construction association. We even had a meeting with the high school. That's me in front of the high school students. It was pretty cool. They were all really energized. To, they, were, thought, they couldn't believe I didn't wear a parka like you're Canadian. Why aren't you 
are you going to melt here? Right? It was so, must be used to the cold. And it wasn't me, I admit, that, that picked up on what was going on. It was the colleague I brought with me, Heather, who's a young mother. She's just about to have her second child. And she's the one that made the observation from all the conversations. She said everyone talked about childcare. Everyone, every group, but no one seemed to put it together. So she did a pitch to them. She proposed that they already had a really good school and they had uh, in the basement at the front of the building in a small cubby put a childcare space that the town helped pay for. Now, if you worked, there were, we went there. They only had five weeks of maternity leave for women. And so there were moms showing up after five weeks of, of maternity leave, giving their virtually newborn children to the this daycare, and they had, must have had 12 or 15 kids under six months old and two care workers. And those care workers were getting paid $7.40 an hour. If you worked at the grocery store, you got 16. So she said, if you're gonna subsidize anyone, why don't, and they had passed a resolution to build a new school, why not build a massive new daycare on there and subsidize quality training and wages for those people and attract new people and say, we guarantee if you live in our community, you will have access to quality childcare. And the town looked at us and said, that's not economic development, that's what we hired you for, get out of town. Well, not quite like that, but they, they were pretty short and they were a little upset. So we left. Three months later, they met with the school. They decided to do exactly what we suggested. And now, six months later, they have identified that their new school is going up. And their housing, they have new developers coming in to build because there's no housing left. The manufacturer's jobs are all full because people moved to that community because of that provision. And it became economic development. Economic development is not always what you think it is, especially with the values and the changing uh, of, of our um, society. And then we have demographic changes, thankfully. I mean, we have more women in the workforce, but I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, we've got to get over this mindset that women are working because they have to work. That was a long time ago when you needed two incomes. Now, believe it or not, women want to work. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we need them in the workforce to make us better. We need diversity in the workforce. The Institute of Corporate Directors, ICD, you guys might be familiar with it, they did some research on the best companies in Canada. I think maybe it extended to North America too. And they discovered something that, that helped educate me. See, I was, uh, 20 years ago, I was one of those guys that said, I want on a board of directors, I don't care if it's volunteer or company or business, I want the best, most qualified people on the board. And you know who they were? 55-year-old white males with an MBA. You know what you get when you put a dozen 55-year-old white males with MBAs in the room? One opinion. Because they all come from the same background, they all have the same experiences, they all have the same education, and you don't get good discussions from that. So the Institute of Corporate Directors discovered that the worst-run companies had that mantra that we wanted the most qualified people and they were 55-year-old white males with MBAs. And the best-run companies deliberately had people from different ethnicities, from different orientations, from different cultures, from different languages and different ages, and they were more uncomfortable meetings at board meetings, but that's because people questioned and challenged each other and that's how they got the best decisions. So the world's changing and your organization, your, your business, your community, your administration needs to have diversity in order to make sure you're coming up with the best planning options for your community. But gone are the days of the cubicle if you're going to try and attract the next generation or anybody who values the work that they're going to do and wants to contribute is going to need something different than a cubicle setting. You need the ability for interaction and conversations and sharing of ideas. Seniors are just as important. Okay? I'm not just saying this as a token for the people who are a little older in this room. Honestly, we have the largest cohort of smart people retiring in the next few years. That is extensive corporate knowledge that we're going to lose in our organizations if we don't find a way to capture it. But most of our organizations are set up that you turn 65 and you retire, like you're going to die. No, you're not. You're, you're about to live. You have freedom. But most seniors actually still want to work and participate in the economy and be involved. In fact, I, I have to quit saying seniors. I, I, I said to this one person, she's 70 years old, and I, I called her a senior and asked her about seniors participating in the economy. And she said, I am not a senior. My mom is 92 and lives in the old folks. She's a senior. 
It's like, I know, she said, honey, 70 is the new 50. <laughs> I, she called me honey. I, I let that one go. But she said, we want to be active. And so I started to do some research on that, and I discovered something. If I asked you to name the number one place in the United States where seniors go to retire, I just want you to pick the state, the number one state seniors go to retire. Florida. Florida. Arizona. Arizona. California. Exactly. Those are the top three ones that everyone says. Do you know the number one place seniors go to retire in the United States is not those? It is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I know. I had the exact same look on my face. Like, what? It's Pennsylvania. It's cold in the winter. Why do people go to retire there? So I did some research. And Pennsylvania, being a Rust Belt state and Lancaster being right in the middle of it, lost massive jobs when they lost major industries. And so a lot of young people moved away. And so the, the elected officials and the administration said, what are we going to do? Our economy is suffering. And they said, hey, let's just focus on the people that live here and see what we can do. And so the population was generally older. So they focused on seniors or semi-retirees, as I like to call them now. And so they started. It was interesting. They, they made sure they focused on these measurements, happiness, so the services that are provided, Housing affordability, not affordable housing, there's a big difference. Healthcare, retirement taxes, the job market, which they found was a very significant driver, and desirability, so the activities available to seniors in their community, and they focused on those six factors. And you know what they found? Things were interesting. First, I mean, focusing on healthcare, it all started when they went to the pharmacies and to the grocery stores and said, you know what, why don't you hire some young people in high school and have them deliver drugs and deliver groceries for seniors? Would you do that? And they got together and said, this is a great idea. And it created some employment for young people, but it was also a service added to seniors that they very much appreciated. And then they passed a bylaw that allowed seniors to drive golf carts. Instead of bike paths, they have golf cart paths and have seniors drive around like that in the summer it's snow to snow, right? It's not after it snows. They made sure that they had walking trails in the community and invested in that, and winter walking trails indoors so that seniors could be and remain active all year long. They focused on, they brought back community garden markets all around the community where, where farmers were bringing in, and the seniors loved it. It was a great social experience, but they also liked their, you know, it reminded them of growing their own gardens and stuff, and they still got that fresh produce. They made sure there were lots of social activities for them, and they introduced pickleball. Like, I don't, I still haven't played this thing, but pickleball is like it. And they converted all their tennis courts to pickleball courts. And they, they didn't even have enough room for the people that wanted to play pickleball for activities. And things were good. The seniors were really happy and their community was doing well. And then they invested in Main Street to make sure it was aesthetically pleasing and it was walkable for seniors. And then they realized something happened. See, they never marketed or advertised their community at all. They just focused on providing services for their local folks and designed their community to make sure that it provided those services for seniors. And you know what? Those seniors in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where do you think they went in the winter? Phoenix, Arizona, California, Nevada, Florida. And you know what they told people there when they met with other seniors? Guess what our community does? They have golf cart trails for us. They have delivery services for grocery stores. They have pickleball courts. It's a beautiful, wonderful place to live. We love it. And a lot of seniors said, why don't we live there in the summer? And so they started to move there. And their, their growth grew. New developers showed up to build seniors' appropriate housing. Their economy started to take off and improved dramatically, and they, not all seniors go away in the winter, so as you can see on the right, they even started to just put up lights. Lights make a big difference for the winter for the seniors that were staying, and they have a reputation of being a year-round seniors community now because not everybody wants to go somewhere warm. And it became such an economic driver that, as you can see, this is an actual picture of the Lancaster's Young Professionals Association. Young people started to move back because with so many seniors and economic activity, there were new business opportunities, so they started to move back. They created awards for the young people to celebrate their innovation and their entrepreneurship and their technology. And now Main Street is bustling so much, you can barely walk down there on the weekends or during the week because seniors don't work all week. It is ripe with economic activity, and they are growing. They still have challenges. I'm not saying it's perfect, but they have turned the corner on despair by focusing on something that made them unique. 
Of course, the idea we often miss is that we think young people need to be engaged when they're 40, right? You guys go keep learning until you're 40 and then you have some experience and I'll give you a job title and then you can do it. No, the world's changing so much that we need them to lead now. Even if you're older in a leadership role, I'm, I'm 46 years old, I'm gonna be 47 right away. Technology, I, I rely on my two young sons to keep me up to date on what's happening with technology because it's coming so fast. Which means if you're a leadership role and you're, you're a little bit older now like my age, you need young people to be there with you helping in the leadership role to make appropriate decisions because this technology thing is gonna continue to accelerate faster and faster and change the economy dramatically that we're dealing with. And it also means that values are shifting because of that. Millennials don't care about titles. Not all of them, most of them. I mean, in all the research I've done and that I've, I've scoured, th these are generalities. But the next generation is not nearly as interested in titles as my generation. I mean, our goal as a Generation X was to join a company, work for that company for 40 years, work 70 hours a week so you could climb the corporate ladder, get to the top of the corporate ladder and get a title, and then someone listened to your idea and then they gave you a gold watch so you could go off and die. Yay! Millennials don't want to do that. They want to work, they're used to working in a flatter environment, the online environment where titles don't matter. Ideas are what matter to them. Ideas are exactly what's important. But if you're going to attract them, you need to give them the opportunity to express their ideas and share them now and find success with them, not climb a corporate ladder or they'll, get, they'll go somewhere else where they're more appreciated. They need color and dynamism in the community. They want coffee shops that look like this, not like Tim Hortons. They want craft brewery places because they want locally brewed beer. They want some connection to their community. They always do. They want yoga studios and they want fresh food markets. And they want it all together. The new, the new thing that we need to do is focus on mixed use communities because that's where the next generation wants to live, in a walkable community that they can, they can experience all of these sorts of things. They want to li work in organizations that lift them up. I mean, they don't belong to the mindset that my generation did. My generation and my parents' generation basically said that if I'm going to get ahead, I have to make sure I beat all of you. Not physically, but, but right? Except the last generation, I remember even making fun of it myself. Millennials grew up in the generation where everyone got a participation award, right? And we used to say, oh, we're going to build a bunch of weaklings. We're dumbing down society. There's no competitiveness. Except millennials actually aren't out to beat each other. They're out to lift each other up and help. And they want to be part of an organization that does that. And I think that may bode well because we're always stronger together. And we don't have to beat someone else to win. We can all win. And so it's a mindset that they're looking for in the workplace, which means they also want diversity. They want diverse food, they want diverse languages, they want diverse culture, that's what they're looking for. They want a, an organization that's gonna support them and their family in the initiatives they need. They want an organization that's going to help make them be better people by providing that ability for, for purpose and autonomy and mastery. They don't care about stuff like we did. My wife and I are still purging every year we go through and we throw out stuff from several years ago and we're getting better at it. But I've discovered that my niece and nephew and the next generation don't accumulate the garbage that we did for the sake of collecting garbage. And they want to enjoy life. I mean, honestly, it is why they take pictures of their food, right? <laughs> We make fun of them, except they're enjoying every moment. They want to work in an environment where they work 40 hours a week, and then they go live. And there's nothing wrong with that. And what they value is important too. Off-the-grid technologies like um, geothermal, wind, solar, battery storage technology. And in fact, they are supporting companies that do things differently now, like Tesla. Everyone knows they make cars. They make these battery storage walls. This is an 11,000 watt storage wall, and it, it can connect to solar panels or not, but it helps if you need a backup power, but it also, if you hook it up to solar panels, will run your house completely. Off the grid homes, off the grid communities are what they're looking for. This is an actual picture of the University of Michigan's first clear solar panel design on the bottom left hand corner. And they put it into a roof at the university and for some reason they're getting conversion rates that are, are as close as they've ever gotten 
to the conversion rates of the solar panels on the International Space Station. They're not sure why yet, but that's pretty impressive. What about the potential and the ability to maybe combine that energy production with solar panels with greenhouses and, and produce food and, I don't know if it's possible, but they're going to be the ones that discover and explore that. And that, of course, all drives changes in society. This guy. Look, I grew up on a farm, a rancher, and I still have people say, oh, the problem with our communities is simple. We used to have a person on every family on every quarter section of land and they had four kids and so our schools were full and our town was full and it helped drive our economy. But we lost the family farm. If we just go back to the family farm, it'll all be good. <laughs> Great. Where do we start? It's not going to come back. That guy is not coming back. But we spend way too much time talking about the, the way it used to be and trying to recapture it instead of understanding there's a renaissance going on in our rural communities and there are new opportunities coming at us. I still have ranchers look at me and say, oh, that damn A&W. It, it has anti, uh, the hormone-free and antibiotics-free beef, right? And I have ranchers say, those guys are killing my business because I don't want to do that and I can't do that and it'll never work anyway. Except the A&W is one of the fastest growing fast food franchises because it initiated that. So look, are you mad at A&W for doing that and changing the way you should do business when consumers are wanting that? I mean, look, Beyond Meat, is growing by leaps and bounds and there are other companies doing the same sort of thing. Now, I mean, it's vegetables pounded into look like beef, I, right? It's vegetable. I eat hamburgers because I think cows are vegetarian based too, right? They eat. <laughs> but you know what? This is growing and this is catching on. And just so you know, I mean, it's an, it's an anecdotal example, but my oldest plays soccer and I took him and his, his whole team out for burgers to A&W. They wanted to go to A&W refused to go to McDonald's. They, sorry about McDonald's. They went to, so we went to NW and I said, okay, what do you guys want to eat? Every single one of them wanted a Beyond Meat burger. Those things are not cheap. I could have bought another house for the, like they're nine bucks each and you had to wait for 10 minutes and it was, but they insisted that's what they wanted. Those things are not going away. And in fact, this, this picture of the Petri dishes with the meat. On the left is real beef cut from a cow and put into a Petri dish. On the right is beef grown in the Petri dish. Yeah. Now, I have ranchers say to me all the time, I could tell the difference between the beef, except chemical experiments can't even tell the difference be between the beef. No one has ever tasted and been able to tell which one is, because they're both beef. And when I ask young people, which one would you prefer? They're like, the one on the left meant you killed the cow, and the one on the right, it just grew in a Petri dish. Well, what's the difference? I'll take the one on the right, because you don't have to kill a cow. S saves and spares all the resources. Now, I still have ranches. Oh, but, but it's not like I, I ride my horse and I fix fence and I get to do all that stuff. Great. You can, you can do that until you lose the farm. And then you can tell everybody you still have the lifestyle or you can adapt and change and get ready for the new demands in your community. Which means we also then have to consider all aspects. Hydroponics and vertical agriculture. We need community gardens back in our communities because that makes neighborhoods. I'm going to say this a couple more times before we're done. Subdivisions are dead. If your community is working on building a subdivision, you're trying to do what we did 30 years ago, and now it's a mistake. Be careful about how you invest. Our next generation wants neighborhoods, not subdivisions. And I'll show you how that changes communities. This is a picture of what I think communities need to look like in the future. All of them. You see how there are no vehicles there? There are lights. God, if you do anything on Main Street, put up some lights. It changes. It's why Christmas is magical. Just a few lights up makes a huge difference. There are trees. There are outside places to eat and socialize. That's what the next generations are looking for. And I'm going to reemphasize this point. My generation and the generation before me would go to work 70 hours a week, climb the corporate ladder, get a title, right? We spent 70 hours a week talking to people and socializing and trying to make sure that we, we were successful. At Friday when we were done, we were peopled out, right? So we went to the basement or to the back room or upstairs to the, the master room and turned on a big screen TV and cocooned because we needed a break. I, I was a people person, but people ruined that for me. Yeah. <laughs> Just joking. I was a people person, but politics ruined that for me. But like I said, I've been through rehab. I'm, I'm good. So they don't. 
the next generation want to do that because they don't work 70 hours a week, they work 40 hours a week and they do a lot of it online and on computers and, and so they work in a flat environment where your title doesn't matter. What do you think they want to do on Friday when they're done work? Go look at another screen? No. They want to go socialize, they want to go do yoga, they want to get physically fit and active, they want to walk, they want a bistro, they want a coffee bar, they want a, a local brew pub, they want social experiences and they want a main street that looks like that. But if you're going to build a main street that looks like that, you also have to start to change the way we build housing. The subdivisions, and I emphasize again, they're dead. Subdivisions, here's what we did 40 years ago. Main streets were incredibly busy. We had businesses on Main Street and people lived up above on the second floor. And so there were people down on Main Street all the time 40 years ago, which kept the restaurants busy. And there, were, there was always activity vehicles there, right? You remember those days? And then we built subdivisions and we moved everyone out onto the edge of town. And at five o'clock when the businesses closed, they closed up the doors and they went home and now there's no one left. And then the the restaurants went broke because there was nobody around to eat because who's going to drive back downtown after you've already got home and now our main streets are dying. Our main streets were always about socialization, not about business. And I know that because my grandpa used to always say, okay, I'm going into town to get supplies, who needs anything? And I would say, can I go with you? He said, what do you need? I'd say, nothing, but all my friends are in town and I want to see them. And he'd be like, okay, next time. You can't go this time, next time. And there never was a next time. And you know why there was never a next time? Because he would spend 15 minutes getting the supplies and spend the rest of the day having coffee and drinking beer and socializing because that's what downtowns were about. That's what they need to be about again. But then we have to change the way we build housing. Not subdivisions with three car garages out on the edge of the city. We need to bring people back down to our downtown cores. And since those millennials want to be out and socializing, they don't want massive basements with 80-foot screen TVs so they can hide out. They need smaller housing. Now, these smaller homes were designed first for military folks in the United States, and then they extended to impoverished folks who couldn't afford big mortgages. But a lot of millennials right now can't afford those, those four-bedroom, four-bathroom, three-car garage homes. And they don't want to be out in the suburbs anyway. They want to be in town. They want to be in a neighborhood not a subdivision, which means we also need to explore new technologies. This, uh, this I can't tell you, it's from a, an architectural firm in Saskatchewan. They, they asked me not to share the name. It is a recreation facility. And what do you notice about it? There's no parking. They're actually designing it for autonomous vehicles. Now, believe it or not, the trees behind there right now, they are putting a parking lot, but they have it already set up so that when autonomous vehicles reach that tipping point, which they believe they will, they're going to be building condos for millennials back there and attaching it to the rec center so that they could just walk over to walking tracks and people of all ages will enjoy diverse housing in their development that they've already uh, started to design. This construction is almost complete. I think November it's supposed to be done in the community in Saskatchewan where they're building it. But we need to change technology then to make sure that we're utilizing and educating people in the full manner in which they want. My nine-year-old, ten-year-old now, eleven-year-old now, man, he's going fast, says to me all the time, Dad, why do I have to go to a school? He's not asking about going to school. He's saying to a building. Because I was a junior high teacher. And when he has trouble with math, he asks me, because he likes to support my ego, Dad, you're smart, can you help me with this? Right? But when he's not, um, when I'm not around, he goes online where a grade five math teacher, she wears a bright red sweater every time, has broken all the grade five math lessons into five minute increments and he goes and learns the lesson because she teaches to his style. He's going to do everything online. And with the Khan Academy, Academy and Linda, education online is growing quickly and more and more people won't care about the building, they'll care about where they can access the education, which gives a great new opportunity for our communities because the school isn't nearly as important as the education. And you can attract young families if you have connectivity so they could reach the world. In fact, did you know, I saw a stat. 2018 was the first time in the history of the internet that education grew faster than pornography on the internet. Yeah. Okay, some of you look, don't worry, there's still lots out there for you. If you're, <laughs> it's, it's not going away, trust me. So, and then autonomous vehicles change the entire structure of how we design communities. But we have to talk to them differently. I'll skip through these ones fast. I know my time is up. 
I went and met with one community. They said, we're trying to reach young people, but they don't get involved. They don't care about volunteering anymore. And then I asked them where they're trying to talk, and they were putting up signs at the billboard by the post office. It's like, young people aren't reading those signs. They don't even go to the post office. So they said, great, we'll try and change it. We'll put ads in the newspapers. Again, sorry, but most young people aren't reading newspapers, so you're not reaching them either. And then they said, oh, well, let's go to our fax poll that we used to have. No word of a lie. They used to fax stuff out in like a fax tree. And I was like, are you... They don't have fat. My friend Brian was the first one that thought it was a good idea that I run an election, and I like Brian. So I was like, okay, this is exciting. This is great, Brian. He called me a couple years ago and said, Doug, I got to send you something. What's your fax number? And I was like, Brian, I can't get a fax on account of where I live. He said, what do you mean? Where do you live? I said, the 21st century. Who sends faxes anymore? I even showed him how to take a picture and scan it and to email it. Brian still uses the fax machine. And that number beside there, 43, you, that's when the first fax was sent. You think that's 1943. It's not. It's 1843 at the World Trade Fair in Paris. That's how old that technology is. But we get leapfrogged and move, refuse to move forward. Then they said social media. We'll use Facebook. I'm sorry, the average age of Facebook is almost my age. Young people are not using it. And besides, the algorithm has been changed so it doesn't show up on your feed anymore. Now it's like watching the billboard and you have to go look at the Facebook page to find the information. And Twitter, just millennials are not enjoying Twitter. It's, it's vitriolic and it's acidic and so skip Twitter. And then some of them even say, well, let's use email and, and voicemail because we'll get modern. Except even J.P. Morgan eliminated voicemail for their non-front-facing employees and they found a 30%, over 30% increase in productivity because voicemail bogs us down. I mean, if you want to get a hold of me, send me a text. Because if you call me, my voicemail will say, please do not leave a message. Text me. Because when you leave me a message, I now have to stop and call, and then I have to get out a piece of paper and write down the name and the phone number, and then I have to stick it somewhere and call you back when I can't. Just text me and say, hey, Doug, can we schedule a time to talk? And I have it recorded on my phone. That's what the next generation wants. Even companies are getting rid of email now for non-front-facing employees because now it's a hot potato. I pass it to you and say, hey, could you check this over? And you're like, yeah, I'll send it over there. And then you send it over there, and it goes all to everyone. And no one does anything with it anymore. It's the way to avoid work. But you have to send the right message. If you're really going to communicate, I recommend Instagram. A picture is worth a thousand words. The pictures you post and the message you send tells people about your community and why you matter. And in fact, it can start a movement. There's a young guy in the United States who went to one of his communities, his community and said, hey, I want to do a garbage cleanup day. And the town, town said, I'm sorry, we'll, 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 we'll work on it. We've got to take it to the mayor. We've got to take it to the uh, CAO the town manager, and then um, we'll have to have a bylaw to pass that, so we'll have to propose that, we have to have public consultation on it, and then we gotta do first reading and second reading, committee of the whole and third reading, and then, then we'll put up a budget to do it, and then we can get it passed, maybe two years? And he was like, forget it. He went and created an Instagram page that said, clean my community. He took a picture of the park he wanted to clean all by himself, before, took a picture of the garbage bags, then took a picture of it after, and posted it. And you know what happened? Thousands of young people on Instagram decided to do the same thing, and we're all starting to clean up their community. No governments involved, no municipalities, nobody whatsoever, because the world is changing. I know millennials, they're kind of demanding, they want things now, and they're used to going on Amazon and buy it, and go on Netflix and watch it, and everything's at their fingertips, which is a problem. But your issue for governance is not that they're too demanding. It's that if you can't be responsive enough, and I have municipal leaders say to me all the time, Doug, how do we be effective? And I tell them, your issue is not whether or not you're gonna be effective. Your issue is whether or not you're gonna be relevant. Because if you can't be faster, they'll bypass you altogether. And that's your biggest challenge. Of course, you have to communicate through this kind of world where this is a poster for the anti-vaxxer movement. And I'm sorry, but that's, it's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard of in the world. Second stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, it was a doctor that fabricated evidence to say that it cause, causes autism. And when he was discredited, someone came to his defense, Jenny McCarthy, and said, this is true. A lying doctor and Jenny McCarthy are not authorities. Yet this has caused a mass hysteria that continues to grow to a point where we now no longer have the herd vaccination principle that protects us. The United States is going to lose its measles-free declaration if it doesn't do something about it soon because people believe the lies that were spread. And look, this is the second dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life, the flat earth conspiracy theorists. 
This is the fastest growing organization in North America. It has over one million members now. They actually believe all the other planets around except the Earth is flat and that there's this ice wall that keeps everything from falling off. It's insane. It is absolutely insane, but it is the fastest growing organization. And you know what? They don't even realize how stupid it is. Their newsletter last year before their biggest conference said, we have new members from around the globe. <laughs> how smart do you have to be to, right? <sighs> Crazy. That's what you have to deal with. All of these, Blockbuster, uh, RCA, Kodak, Sears, Xerox, Polaroid, MySpace, all died or are in the process of dying. Every single one of them had opportunities to capture new technology. Kodak invented digital photography in the 70s. Xerox invented Windows and gave it to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs because they didn't see any value in it. All of these organizations, all these businesses thought, hey, we're the cutting edge and we don't have to do anything and didn't adapt to the change and they died. Now when you do this, you're gonna have resistors, NIMBYs, not in my backyard, Bananas, build absolutely nothing, anywhere near anything. <laughs> yep, nopes, not on planet Earth. Cave people, citizens against virtually everything. And fears, the newest group that is not just going to tell you why they're opposed to something. They make sure everyone else in the room is also opposed by spreading fear. And usually it's based on half-truths and lies. But their goal is to make sure you don't adapt to change and don't move forward. And when you're redesigning your community, you're going to face all of these people. You have to be prepared. And if you let them own the mic, you'll let them own your future. The change is coming. I hope you're ready. And if you're not, give me a call. Happy to talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that uh, thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure it's left uh, many of us in the room thinking critically about the way we manage and approach change in our personal and professional lives. Uh, we will now um, be taking our morning break uh, until our next session, which, which start at 10.30. Except for those who are on uh, the rivers that join us, uh, please immediately uh, meet us in the uh, downstairs lobby. Okay, thanks.